The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. It's Carl Thompson here from StorageCraft. I'm a senior sales engineer for the APAC region. Um, I am currently based in New Zealand um, and yeah, looking forward to uh, doing a presentation today on StorageCraft Cloud Services. So just to let you know, while everyone's joining, um, I am recording the session. You will all be emailed a copy of the recording uh, afterwards. I think it usually happens the following day. Um, I have also attached a handout, uh, which has got the Cloud Services data sheet on it for your information. Um, yeah, looking forward to taking you through an overview of this product, um, and then I'll, I'll jump in and do a live demonstration of uh, how, you know, how you can use it and get up and running. So um, just giving it another sort of minute or so here, I can see a, a number of people coming through. Um, what I will do for this webinar is if, if you've got any questions along the way, please feel free to type them in, um, but I won't, uh, I won't actually review them until we get to the end. And that just gives a chance for people that have, that have uh, you know, heard what they want to hear to, to jump off, uh, and then I can spend some time on Q&A. You know, I'm happy to go back through and show anything that, that you, I may have overlooked or something you want to uh, learn about further. Um, so, you know, we've got plenty of time. I think we've got an hour for this webinar. I'll probably only spend around half an hour on the presentation and the demo. Um, so leave plenty of time and, and yeah, we should definitely finish within that time frame. All right, well, let's get started. Um, I've just had confirmation you can all hear me okay and my screen has been shared. So if you've got any problems, um, you know, you might need to just jump off and back on again, but it seems like um, we're up and running. Okay, so I just... Look over here. Um, so firstly, I guess, what, what is StorageCraft Cloud Services? So it's a purpose-built disaster recovery platform, uh, you know, DR as a service for total business continuity. Uh, the idea is you can protect on-premise business systems and data and offer business continuity by running those, uh, running that infrastructure in our cloud. Um, so it's really, you know, designed for uh, users that want to offer business continuity if they suffer some form of failure on-prem, whether that's ransomware and they don't have the ability to recover locally, um, or whether it's been some more catastrophic failure or site failure and they want to, uh, you know, recover in the cloud and offer, offer business continuity. Now, there are varied service levels, so if you don't all want business continuity but you want an option to get the data off-site, um, you know, we have the more basic offerings um, that, that are part of the solution. So I'll be covering that off. The key thing to understand with StorageCraft Cloud Services is you need to be using one of our data protection solutions. So whether it's our next generation ShadowSafe, our OneSafe Solo, which is based on the ShadowSafe technology, or our traditional Shadow Protect and Shadow Protect SPX, obviously, all of these products um, can back up and or replicate to the storage craft cloud services. So I'll dig into each of these and, and how they fit in and, and I'll obviously demo across these products in terms of the integration with the cloud. Um, but yeah, very flexible from that perspective um, in terms of using our you know, data protection solutions to uh, combine with our DR as a service. So some of the key features, uh, obviously it's a custom built DR cloud solution. So we've actually deployed our own infrastructure into a tier three data center in Australia. So it's uh, next DC in Sydney. So for our, our wider APAC region, um, all of the, the cloud services is operational from our own kit um, based in next DC in Sydney. Um, we are looking to uh, extend this capability into um, some public cloud offerings, um, you know, hopefully towards the end of this year. Um, the key thing will be that it'll have exactly the same experience. And some of the things that are really cool and, and what we've been able to achieve is things like giving you full control to instantly virtualize simplified networking, but the ability in the worst case to actually view the console and boot into safe mode or boot into recovery environment if something's really broken. We've actually got a lot of flexibility that is inherently um, you know, quite limited in some of these uh, common public cloud solutions. So we've built a very scalable uh, and robust solution to, to give our customers the most flexibility. Um, the, the flexibility uh, also comes in different service levels around simple backup, file and fold recovery, and then Full virtualization of entire machines and the whole network. Um, so I'll talk uh, a bit more about these different levels and where they fit in with our products. Um, but it's all web-based control. So at any time, you can log in, you can request a BMR drive, you can download your backups out of our cloud. If you've got uh, the file and folder 
uh, level recovery uh, service, then you can obviously instantly uh, zip up files and get them out, or um, the full virtualization, you can obviously immediately log in and instantly virtualize. Um, and the really cool thing is it's at no cost. So each machine on our, our premium virtualization can virtualize up to 30 days per year. So it's great, every month or every quarter you can do some testing, it's not gonna cost you anything. You've got full console control to go through that process. So you know the, the big thing is it's all inclusive, there's no cost and you can do it right away. You don't need to call anyone, you can do it yourself and you can test it at any time. So it's the all inclusive uh, that makes us really attractive. Um, so you know that whole self-service. Uh, and then obviously in a tier three data center with military grade security, tier three data center offers us significant robust around uptime um, and redundancies um, that we've built into our infrastructure and that come with the data center. And then we have a 24 by seven um, monitoring um, NOC team that, that monitor this whole solution. So in terms of the service levels, there's three service levels available, but it then does depend on the product you're using. So I'll have to clarify this a bit as we go, but Cloud Blasic uh, is basically the ability to archive of critical business backups. So this is effectively a copy of your backups in the storage craft cloud, generally short term, but you can obviously uh, increase retention in our cloud. This service level is only available for the Shadow Protect product line, okay? Shadow Protect actually works across all of these service levels, um, but as we move into Cloud Plus, this is also available for Shadow Protect and Shadow Safe. Um, so this gives you also immediate uh, file and folder level recovery. So it actually allows you to access the contents of the backups, quickly zip up a file or some folders, download them and get them back to someone. So it might be someone that doesn't need the full virtualization capability, they just wanna get a, a, you know, a database or, or something or a file out quickly, uh, and then they're happy to wait to download or, or for us to ship back a BMR drive. Uh, and then we have Cloud Premium. So again, this is available by all product lines, uh, including, and, and this is the only option that we make available with the OneSafe Solo. Um, because that, that's what it's in line with. And I'll talk a little bit about that some more. But Cloud Premium is generally what we sell around 85 to 90% of. Uh, this includes everything in Cloud Basic and Plus, as well as instant virtualizations of systems and failover in the cloud. So this is the full business continuity, all the CPU, the memory you need to bring up your infrastructure. We have a full pre-configurable networking backend that comes online, um, and, and I'll run you through the options that are available there to get your users up and running. Um, so the standard model, and there's, there's different ways we can license this around perpetual and MSP, but most commonly is that MSP per machine per month pricing. Um, and generally uh, for the MSP, um, each machine that they add into a service level will add an additional terabyte to their pool of storage. So each machine gives you an additional terabyte. So if one machine goes over, you know, the average hopefully is under that one terabyte per machine, it means there's no overage cost. So works very well, you know, a typical customer might have you know, um, say five machines and it gives them five terabyte pool, but their, um, you know, their, their typical server might only be three, 400 gig, then they've got an extra large file server and it balances out. So it works quite well. Uh, and for our MSP partners, this is across you as the partner. So each customer accesses that, that entire pool, which uh, you know, makes it very flexible for, for most of your needs. Uh, each machine gets 30 days a year of virtualization included. Um, so if you need to test it for a couple of hours a month, that'll only take a couple of hours off the 30 days. So it's an, an hourly deduction of usage. Um, and we've got some nice ways of, of helping you manage that and alert you to machines that are running and so forth. Um, and then expedited BMR drive. So we can, um, you know, I'll talk a bit more about how this works as I demo it, but basically we can get BMR drives couriered back to you relatively quickly. Uh, and likewise with uh, C drives, if you want to send your initial backups to us on a C drive, we can generally get them overnight shipped um, and then, you know, with a return courier bag to get back to the data center. So the infrastructure, you know, obviously with Cloud Basic and Cloud Plus, it's largely around the storage, um, which is distributed storage system, robust, redundant, uh, you know, includes all the bells and whistles of encryption um, at rest and in transit uh, with a global uh, and scalable solution. Uh, but as we start shifting into Cloud Premium, this is where it starts to become very attractive for a lot of our partners, particularly with Shadow Protect, which has been around for a long time, 2003 in fact, uh, is when Shadow Protect was released. 
but we've had a lot of partners in this region, you know, set up FTP services and have all of their customers replicate their backups into their office or into their data center. But what a lot of them have struggled to do is offer the ability to virtualize, but then also not just spin them up, but also provide business continuity. Can we get a public IP to this network? Can we isolate that network? Can we set up port forwarding, RDP, VPNs, all of that kind of stuff has become more complex or requires further investment in infrastructure. And this is where cloud services becomes a perfect upsell or a premium offering to your customers because it includes all of these components to get the customer up and running in the event of a disaster. So when you start looking at it, some of the key things to think about, um, the, the most popular licensing as I touched on earlier was the MSP licensing per machine per month. And we have what's called a bundle. So if the software, whether it's Shadow Protect or Shadow Safe, is licensed via MSP, then as you add that machine into the cloud, we will automatically bundle that as a license and a cloud machine and you get a combined discounted rate. So when you're looking at our uh, MSP pricing for our partners, uh, the bundle, there's no way to buy the bundle or select it or turn it on. It happens by default as the backup software and that same machine is in the cloud, we will then bill that at the end of the month as a bundle. So it's a very attractive price. Um, you should allow for each customer to have a public IP. You can obviously not do this and request it in the event of a disaster, but by having it there upfront allows you to pre-configure a lot of the settings. And I'll show you this uh, during the demo why that, that's a good idea. So it's a, it's a minimal cost. The customer just needs one for their network unless they've got something more complex and want to have multiple. So you can jump in there and request them as you need. Uh, and then there's some options around replication. So with replication, you can either send a daily consolidation, which happens at midnight, it consolidates and then will be sent up to the cloud. Or you can say, no, I want to send them immediately. So you could be backing up every 15 minutes, 24 seven, that's 96 times a day. That can be immediately verified and sent to our cloud. So I'll, I'll show you through those options during the demo. And then of course the last thing is, is these are the key things. There's a couple of other options in the pricing around additional recovery points and, and archive and stuff. I'm not going to go through all of that today. Um, but the other key one is the C drive, particularly if you're wanting to get up and running quickly. Sorry, I'm just drawing my pointer there. Particularly if you want to get up and running quickly, a C drive is a good thing to do first because that might take a day or two to get shipped to you. Uh, you need to have that available before you can proceed with sending them to our cloud because it's one of the first things you're going to do um, when setting it up. Um, the other um, key thing as well is when we talk about uh, the OneSafe solo, and in fact ShadowSafe can now do this as well, has the ability to back up direct to cloud, so no storage is required on-prem at all. With Shadow Protect, you need to back up locally, and then the image manager software, which I'll talk about some more, will do the replication to our cloud. With ShadowSafe and, and OneSafe Solo, these actually offer the ability to have no storage on site and back up direct to cloud, which is really cool. Uh, and of course, um, they do also support using a NAS storage to have a local backup and then a replication to the cloud, uh, internal storage with the Solo specifically, as well as the USB drive. So Solo is very flexible um, because it's on a small appliance, offering you the ability to, to have storage in, in the box as a USB drive. ShadowSafe or Solo can leverage existing NAS infrastructure as well, and then obviously direct to cloud. So that's quite cool. When we're looking at Shadow Protect, some of the key things you need to know if you're using Shadow Protect is if you're either using Shadow Protect SPX or if you're still using Shadow Protect 5, make sure you're on version 5.2.7, which is the latest release. That is a good idea to do that first. The second thing is to make sure you're using a continuous incremental backup schedule. What we don't want to do is send full backups every day or every week or every month to the cloud. We do one full backup and then have the image manager software manage the consolidation, retention, and replication. So continuous incremental backups is required, uh, as well as encrypted backup images. So if you are currently using continuous incrementals, but you're not encrypting your backups, unfortunately you do have to delete the job and start again. There's no way to go and re-encrypt those existing backups. So those are two really important things you should be doing. Obviously, then you need image manager, which is required as part of a continuous incremental backup, um, but this is also going to handle the replication of those backups for you as a job. Uh, and then fifth, I mean, this wasn't a hard requirement, but you should have a DR plan with a customer. And I'm gonna talk about that next because the DR plan is really helps you bring this whole picture together and understand what bits need to go on the cloud and, and how am I gonna get the user up and running. 
So, you know, the whole thing is we've got this amazing platform that can offer business continuity, but you need to spend some time making sure you understand your customers' needs so that in the event of a, a problem, you're prepared and you can get them up quickly. So some of the things to think about, and I've got a bit of an example I made here, you've got some production servers on site, you know, this has got the Shadow Protect icon there, but it could be Shadow Safe, um, and you're backing up to, or replicating to Storage Craft Cloud Services. Now, generally, um, what, what could go wrong? So the first thing, let's look at the example, one machine gets crypto, okay? Now, ideally, I mean, the site's operational, people are still working there. Ideally, we want to use virtual boot to recover quickly on site, whether it's Shadow Safe, One Safe Solo, or Shadow Protect, all of these products can instantly virtualize backups into Hyper-V, VMware, um, or a standby environment to get up and running quickly. And the great thing with that is it's local, the performance is gonna be there locally, you're not running in the cloud and we don't have to get it back out of the cloud. However, if you don't have that capability to recover locally, then this is where the storage craft cloud can come in handy. So you can virtualize there. Um, we have IPsec site to site VPN built into our cloud. So as soon as you virtualize the server, you can actually have it pre-configured to automatically establish that IPsec VPN to the customer's firewall. So that's one thing to think about. Next scenario, let's say we have a more catastrophic failure and we've suffered a complete outage of some description. So what happens then? And this is really where you need to start talking to the customer. Where are people going to go and what are they going to need to do? If they're a warehouse and everything's run there and, and um, you know, they suffered a problem, you know, the chances are there might be a majority of workers that actually there's nothing they can do without that factory running. So therefore it might just be admin staff. What, what do they need to do and where are they going to go? Are we going to go and relocate them to a temporary office? Can we put in a firewall there, site to site VPN? Do they have laptops they can come in, plug in, and just continue working? That, that could be a great solution. Likewise, if they've got remote branches, we can establish multiple IPCX back to the cloud um, to keep these uh, branch offices functional. Uh, it might be that temporary office isn't the plan and users are going to go home. So uh, StorageCraft Cloud has built in uh, open VPN clients, so each user can establish a VPN directly to the cloud and continue working from home. Um, and then of course, you know, as in line with uh, um, requesting a public IP, you can start setting up port porting. So things like email services, web servers, uh, you might even find that the customers traditionally used remote desktop server and they use RD Gateway. And this is a fantastic scenario because you might find, well look, actually, these users can go home, they don't need a VPN because all we'll do is change the DNS record for their, um, the A record for the RD Gateway server, point to the storage craft cloud, and they continue working as they did with no changes. They don't even need to know that it's failed over to the cloud. So there's a lot of automation and flexibility around different things, but a lot of it comes down to where are people gonna go and what do they need to do? If the majority of people need to access the file server and they work on large files, well, we tend to know that accessing large files over a VPN isn't a fantastic you know, experience. And that's where, you know, do we need to have a remote desktop server as part of the solution? Uh, or is it just simple applications they're accessing that would be fine over a VPN? Or are there some servers that don't need to be in the cloud um, you know, or they only need a lower service plan because they don't need to be virtualized. So you have all the flexibility uh, to tailor the solution to suit the customer and can be pre-configured in our cloud with the networking so that it's ready to go at the click of a button. So, you know, again, where will people go? What services or applications are, are required in the event of different types of disasters will help you ascertain what needs to be in the cloud. And think about the options, site-to-site -site VPN, VPN client, uh, port forwarding, that kind of thing and then pre-configure it in the cloud. I mean, you don't have to, but then if something goes wrong, you've then got to figure out what are all the firewall rules I need to do, and it's going to take time to get the customer functional, which could already be a stressful time. So the great thing is there's no cost to pre-configure and test all of the components in the cloud, and we've made it really easy with a very simple front end to do that. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into a demo, um, and, and I'll run you through the different options. So the first uh, place we're going to start, and this is really um, going to be from a, I guess from a, initially from a reseller point of view. So I don't know if I've actually got any end users on this um, on this call today. Uh, sorry, on this webinar. But basically, I'm logging into the partner portal now. If you are an end user and a partner has provisioned you with an account, um, you just simply go to cloud.storagecraft.com and you can log in there with the account. I'm just gonna quickly run through how a partner will get to that uh, step first, uh, and then we can proceed from there. 
creating an account is really the first thing you're going to do, a, a cloud services account in the MSP portal. It's just right there under cloud services. So in here, um, I've got a number of accounts already, so these are effectively customers. So I go in here and go add cloud account. And effectively, I give it a name, obviously for billing purposes, username and password. Now the username and password is going to be used by the backup product on site to, to start um, replicating or backing up to Storage Craft Cloud. This username and password can also be used by the end user customer to log in and access their, their, their environment in our cloud. So username and password, uh, the account permissions are going to be what this user will have access. Obviously as the partner, you will have full access. Um, you know, obviously you will still need to know the encryption key, uh, but you'll be able to uh, help the customer uh, separately from these permissions. And then you've got your default retention settings. Um, so, you know, the default uh, retention is in our cloud is keeping the last three days plus the last two end of week recovery points. So it's very short retention designed for disaster recovery and business continuity. You can, of course, uh, increase this or change this as required and, and it will reflect a pricing change um, that you'll need to refer to your pricing calculator for. So that's how to set up an account. It's very straightforward. One of the first things you may want to do if you are setting up an account, if required, is go in and request a C drive. Because again, this is going to be one of the next things we need to do once we're up and running on-prem. And, and if you, you're wanting to move quickly, it's a good idea to get this first. So select the account, select Seed BMR, and click Request C drive. And again, you're just putting in details uh, and requesting a C drive. I think by default, um, I've just got to select the country there first. I think by default, I might have to fill out more of this form first. I'll just double check. Yeah, okay. By default, the only option for a C drive is two terabytes. Um, so if you're, if if one machine's backup or, or you know your combined machines is going to exceed two terabytes, um, th there's some options. So firstly, um, if you've got multiple machines, um, but each individual machine is under two TB, then you can actually request multiple drives uh, in in the same single shipment. So four drives. It doesn't cost any more to have four drives or instead you can log a support request and say, hey, um, can I please get a larger drive? You know, can, I, can you please just send me a larger six terabyte disk instead of you know, a couple of two terabytes because I want to fit them all on, or, or I've got a large machine that won't fit on a single drive. Um, so get that uh, requested through support. Uh, they'll help you through that process and they can either enable it in here in the dropdown for you or they can organize it for you. So that's um, the process there. Now, uh, at this point, you're now ready to get the on-site stuff uh, replicating up one way or another. So I'm going to um, bring up my lab environment here. Uh, I've got uh, a shadow safe environment open here. So I'll start here first. This will be the same experience whether you're using shadow safe or one safe solo. But basically, you're going to go into configuration. You're going to go over to storage. And you're going to go and add in the storage craft cloud uh, type. So you'll be adding in an account for each customer. So each customer will have their own Storage Craft Cloud account, and that way their network and environment in our cloud is separated. So you'll add in, um, you know, give it a, a name for your reference, the name of the customer, the username and password is what we've just set up in the Storage Craft Cloud, uh, and then you'll need to define an image password. So this will be the Shadow Safe so, or One Safe Solo backups encrypted in our cloud. You'll need to know this encryption key when you want to recover from our cloud. So you'll specify that here, and then any machine that is uh, set to replicate or backup to this location um, will be applied this encryption. So it's done slightly differently with Shadow Protect because uh, it's done in the backup job, but with Shadow Safe we do it at the storage level, which which does tend to simplify things to some degree. So that's uh, how it's set up. Then you'll jump over to policies. Uh, you'll add a new policy. And in here, you'll obviously have the backup policy for the customer. You'll choose how frequent you want to do the initial backups. And then for the storage destination, you can choose to either backup to some local storage, and then we can add in replication to the Storage Craft Cloud. So I'm just going to go here and select the Storage Craft Cloud. And then we choose if we want to replicate uh, hourly or daily. So this is showing me the flow. I'm backing up from on-site to some local storage, some NFS storage on a NAS, and then it's replicating a copy every hour to the Storage Craft Cloud. The other option with ShadowSafe and OneSafe Solar is we can actually back up directly to the cloud. So if I, um, actually I think because I've already selected, I need to remove it from here first. 
Uh, let's try this again. That's cloud. So this is what I call DR services of the Storage Craft Cloud. But if I select that, it is now going to back up directly to Storage Craft Cloud. It does not require any local storage. Um, I can obviously opt to use a C drive here if, if I want to. Um, but what you'll notice is I can't define any local retention because obviously that is now handled by the cloud defaults um, that were pre-configured and we can override per machine in the cloud, but all retention is handled um, by the cloud. So it's, it's that easy, obviously then I can go and apply that policy to machines for protection um, and so forth. One thing I will add is that in the one system for ShadowSafe and, um, and OneSafe Solo, we will be adding in in the future, I think the, the, the tentative plan is for early next year, um, to have the cloud portal actually available from here. So you won't need to log out and you know you won't need to have a second, separate browser open to the storage craft cloud portal. So that will streamline that user experience into the into the one system. Uh, when we start looking at Shadow Protect, uh, obviously there's two components. There's the Shadow Protect software on each computer uh, that you're backing up. And the key thing, as I mentioned earlier, is you must have encryption enabled. You'll note I can't go and subsequently modify this. So if you're not currently doing encryption, then you will need to create a new job. Uh, and of course, you'll need to use a continuous incremental backup schedule, which of course requires image manager. So those are the two requirements for our cloud. Uh, and then from the image manager perspective, um, what you'll do is go ahead here and go create job, replication job, and you'll select storage craft cloud and you go in and add in the location, which will be the username and password again that we set up in the Storage Craft Cloud portal. So very easy to do. Uh, once you authenticate, I've already got one saved here. You'll note the, uh, actually didn't do it, maybe because I did it earlier. When I hit save, it'll show me here. Just spinning around, that's just confirming that it can connect to our cloud. So if this fails, it'll pop up with an error and it'll mean, you know, obviously something's blocking it from communicating with our cloud. At this time, you'll also need to specify the Shadow Protect image password for the encryption so that our cloud can obviously decrypt that and manage those backups. Uh, and then for the replication mode is where you'll choose whether you want to either immediately replicate as soon as the backups come through, i.e. every hour or every 15 minutes, uh, or instead, you know, still back up every 15 minutes or every hour by default, but wait for the consolidated image at midnight and then just send that up once a day. Um, so I will add, actually, I forgot to mention earlier, if you choose to immediately replicate, and that's the same with uh, ShadowSafe, which can do hourly, uh, this is an extra charge. It's a minimal charge per month per machine that you want to do this on. The default pricing is based on just sending the daily image to the cloud. Um, and then with, um, with uh, Shadow Protect, um, you'll need to choose a service level. So with ShadowSafe um, and uh, Solo, they default to premium. Um, with Shadow Protect, you can choose at any time here. So Cloud Basic Premium. Uh, once you choose this, you can no longer change it from within Image Manager, but it can be edited in our cloud. Uh, but it will be, you know, there will be a, a minimum wait time if you want to suddenly go from basic to premium. Uh, you know, it'll actually wait for the next billing change before you can enable that. Um, so yeah, basically choose that. Um, you can have it generate a warning if there's an extra large incremental. Uh, and you can obviously choose as a shadow safe if you want to initially use a C drive. If you don't use a C drive, there's obviously no, no way to add it later. Once you hit save, it will start sending that up over the internet straight away. Um, so what I tell most people is look, figure out what your upload bandwidth is um, and look at what the data set is that you've got that you're going to be backing up and replicating and then just run it through a bandwidth calculator. So, you know, I've got, uh, you know, 500 gig of data here um, and um, my bandwidth is, you know, 100 megabit how long is that going to take? So just Google a bandwidth calculator and it'll give you some estimates and you might go, cool, you know what, I think that's pretty achievable. I'm going to kick it off on a Friday afternoon and then it's got a weekend to, to chug up there and that, that might be the less impactful way to manage it. Uh, Image Manager does offer some abilities around um, throttling for replication where we can say, you know, restrict the bandwidth to just 20 megabits between these times during working hours, for example. Uh, we don't currently have this capability in the Shadow Safe solution. It is something we uh, have on the roadmap to develop um, to, to give you a similar uh, capability, but it does work quite nicely where, again, you're concerned about um, saturating the, the customer's bandwidth during working hours. Um, but again, if it's something you're concerned about, use the C drive um, to overcome that initial base image, and then it's just the incremental changes going forward. So generally pretty manageable. Okay, so from this perspective, uh, we're back in the cloud. 
Um, we've got an account. If I click on machines, it'll start listing all of the machines that are in our cloud, showing me the service level, premium, basic, and so forth, and what the consumption is. I can actually expand this out further and, and see all of my machines in here. Um, I'll click on this one. In fact, I've got it listed twice. So I'm not sure which one. I probably started a, a replication and cancelled it at some point. Um, so just click on this. I'm just waiting for it to load up here. It looks like this one was just as Cloud Basics. I'm going to select the other machine here. Give this a second to load. Um, and it's going to give me a bit more information um, because I think this one's the one I'm currently repairing. So I can see here again, it's Cloud Premium. Again, there's a lock symbol here. So I've got to unlock it to change it. And it'll be a stand down time. I can see how many days left out of the 30 per calendar year. I've got to virtualize. So we'll do that in a minute. Um, I can see my recovery points each day coming through here. Um, this one's actually with Shadow Protect, so I can see the Shadow Protect image numbers. Um, and I can, if I've got Cloud Plus or Cloud Premium, I can obviously mount them for file and folder recovery. I can come in here and say, I want to archive this point, which means it will never get removed by retention, and obviously there's a cost associated with that. Um, I can also request a BMR drive. Um, so BMR drive, uh, will be us um, converting this into a single backup, putting it on a uh, drive and shipping it back to you by courier. Um, there's a couple of methods around if it's just basic or plus, obviously you can do it any time. If it's cloud premium, you'll want to virtualize first, uh, have users start running, and while uh, that VM's running, it will take hourly snapshots, and as those um, are snapshotted, um, you know, or at least once we've got one of them, or when you're ready, you then request the BMR drive, and we'll actually put the most recent backup on the drive, ship it back to you. While that's in transit, obviously you're still running in the cloud. We've got a really fantastic process of pre-staging the data on the disk back to the machine, uh, and then um, syncing the final changes, offering a very quick cut over time. So I'll actually just show you uh, when I click on BMR drive. Uh, similar to the C drive, in fact, we just need to know what you're doing. This is saying that there's no VM running or hasn't done the first snapshot yet, so that happens obviously every hour. Um, but if I go proceed with drive, I actually have an option to say don't don't uh, courier it to me, I'll just download it. So again, we will have to still do a conversion of the image first and then you can just download it. Um, but that's very easy um, to do straight from the portal, you don't need to call us or anything to initiate that. But if I go ahead here and uh, virtualize this VM, uh, what it is asking for. It does say shadow protect image password. This is actually referring to the image password, whether it's shadow safe, one safe solo, or shadow protect. So I do need to adjust the wording here. Um, but if I put in my encryption key. Uh, and then what we do for testing is allow you to select a number of days to auto destroy. And it just forgets, it just enables you to make sure you don't forget to delete it and it doesn't consume up all your 30 days. Of course, if you select real failover, we're not going to ever destroy the machine. It will continue running and, and that will trigger us to start taking backups for you. Um, and the other thing, when we take the backups, is it doesn't require you to configure the backup software. We will do that. Uh, we, we'll manage that process for you. So again, I'll just do a test here of one day and click virtualize. Now, every machine by default in our cloud will get six gigabytes of RAM uh, and two CPU cores. What we ask you to do is come in here and test it. Um, now, just before I continue on there, you can see here it is creating a network. So this is the very first thing when you virtualize the first server for a customer account is that the first server will need to start up the network first. And I'll talk about this in a minute. The network takes about 30 seconds or a minute to load up, and then it will proceed with um, creating this VM and booting it. So as I mentioned, uh, by default, um, six gig of RAM, two CPU cores. If you test it and you find it slow, or you know that it's going to be running quite a, um, you know, a demanding workload, then please log a ticket. Say this is my cloud account. This is the name of my machine, or you can list multiple machines. Say, can you please give this one, you know, 12 CPU calls and 32 gig RAM, or whatever you need. It doesn't cost you anything. Once you've asked for that, it'll be applied to the machine. You'll never need to ask again. No matter how many times you destroy it and turn it on, it will always have that resource. And this just helps us capacity plan and scale out. We can geolocate our customers based on where they're uploading from and make sure that we've got enough compute resource to bring up geographical regions in the event of a problem with the appropriate resource that you've requested. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a one-time thing. Again, it's not a cost thing. It just enables us to ensure our infrastructure can meet your demands at any given time. 
Uh, but we can see here now this VM's been created. It's just now in the final processes, uh, process rather of virtualizing. I'm just going to watch this closely because I want to show you what happens um, when the machine starts up. And obviously, I've done this machine manually. There's a way to automate uh, the whole failover, and I'll show you that uh, next. But basically, what we do with every machine, uh, specifically Windows machines, uh, when you boot them, is we'll send it into Windows Boot Manager for the first 30 seconds. And this was just a nice way for you to quickly go in and say, actually, I'd, I'd like to boot this in safe mode. I might want to disable Exchange SMTP queue from running or disable my monitoring agents, otherwise they're going to generate alerts that you know, it's now running in the cloud and so forth. So, um, you know, Boot Manager just gives you the, the flexibility. You don't have to quickly get in there and hammer F2 or F12 or whatever it is. Um, but if you don't, obviously, it will just proceed with the normal boot. Um, so yeah, very easy. Again, no cost to virtual virtualize. You can do it yourself, as I've just done instantly. You can do it for testing, uh, and it's obviously there for DR. So very flexible um, from that perspective. As I mentioned, in a real failover, every hour we take a snapshot of the running VM, and that assists us with an expedited BMR drive to get that back to you with the most recent snapshot of data, as well as the original backup that you sent us, so you have options, and then also, uh, a full wizard-driven process to actually pre-restore that data. It will then sync, uh, basically the recovery environment will sync with the images that keep getting backed up in our cloud. So the first sync might take you know, a while, depending on how much has changed. Uh, and then it will automatically sync every hour. And effectively, you just wait until you click finalize. And it might be, look, customer, at lunchtime, can everyone log off? We're going to cut back on site. You'll click finalize. It will automatically and gracefully shut down the VM in our cloud. It'll take a final offline snapshot. It'll then send that last hour or less of data back on site. It'll restore that. And generally, within five to 10 minutes, you're booting back up on site. So a very streamlined pre-stage process that enables us to get up very quickly. Um, so look, while this is still virtualizing here, um, normally it only takes one to two minutes. I can't remember if I've given this extra resource. Oh, actually, here we go. Let's just come up now. So if I just quickly go view, it's going to do an in-browser uh, console connection. And I can see here it's got 18, 17, 16 seconds left before it's going to proceed. But this is just a nice way if you wanted to, to, to go into safe mode. Uh, again, I know some people don't want their VMs in our cloud to come online, so they might want to disable services, or, or they can obviously configure the firewall to, to prevent that as well. Um, but that, that just gives you some nice flexibility. But as I mentioned right at the start, because this is a purpose-built uh, facility by StorageCraft, we're able to give you full console access to watch this VM come up and deal with any type of problem uh, rather than just being stuck because it's not booting. Um, so while that's coming up, um, if we go and take a, a look back at the account level, so obviously I've dug into a specific machine here. If I go back to the account level, this is obviously where we went to request the C drive before. Uh, this is where we can go and set retention. So this is the global retention for the account. I can then obviously go into a machine where I was before and have specific retention for a specific machine. If I want one of my machines to have longer monthly archival or what have you, we can do that as well. Um, and we can also do account alerts. So this is this is a good way. Uh, you know, we can do it at the account level, uh, or as an MSP, they can do it across all of their accounts. But this is a great way. In fact, I'll, I'll do it down here on the on the bottom left um, because this allows us to do a single alert across multiple accounts. Um, but basically, um, you know, upload and activity is, is quite a, a popular one. What that's doing, saying regardless of whatever's happening on site, if our cloud has not received backups within X number of days, then our cloud will email whatever emails you want to say, hey, I have not received a backup. You know, maybe something's wrong. Um, there's there's various different options for alerting. You know, a large machine. You know, because each machine includes a terabyte, you might want to know if any machine goes over a certain amount of gigabytes, and then you know, obviously, you may adjust billing based on that or whatever you want to do. So there's a lot of options. Uh, all the different alerts are available uh, when you click the drop down as to what you might want to be alerted to. If you've left a machine running, if someone's deleted or added a machine, it could go to accounts and so forth. So a uh, very flexible alerting, uh, which gives you sort of a fail safe, regardless of what might be happening on prem. Now, finally, the last thing I wanted to show you was the networking. This was the bit that's probably the most exciting in terms of the, the real business continuity. So I'm just going to uh, minimize some of these uh, panes here just to make a bit more room. Basically, each account will have its own network. This network is based on a PFSense firewall. 
Um, by default, the firewall is not running. It will say no router. I'm just going to refresh this because I know that this account is now running. Um, so just bear with me here while I hit refresh. Um, there we go. So it says active because that, that one was the one that we set up. So by default, if no VMs are running, the firewall is off. So if you're trying to test some of the configuration, you obviously need to have a VM running to enable the firewall to, to do any testing. Likewise, if you make any changes in here, you will need to restart the network so that it rereads the configuration. Uh, we will virtualize a PFSense firewall in the back end. This is a simple front end to use to set that up. If there's something you want to do that's more complex than what's available here, support can enable this option to manually configure the network. This will effectively import the config that you've done into the firewall and it will give you uh, the admin credentials to log into the PFSense for, for this customer. So it's, a, it's in a private network. This can only be accessed from a machine that's running in our cloud already. Uh, and you'll be able to go and do advanced configuration. You can obviously export that out of PFSense uh, and store a copy um, so that you, you can have it all pre-configured. Uh, if you run into any problems, obviously configure here is going to revert you back to our very easy to use front end portal. And I'll just run you through this quickly. So the first thing is, what subnet do you want to be running in our cloud in the event of a disaster? It might need to match what the customer is doing on-prem. You might say, hey, my plan is for IP6 site-to-site -site VPN, so I want it to be different so I can route between the two networks. So at any time, you can monitor this. All of the private IP ranges are available to choose from, and that will be the network uh, that gets virtualized. If any of the machines you'll be running in our cloud are part of an Active Directory network, what you will also want to do is specify what IPs those servers will be booting with. And that actually matches up um, with the servers down here. So if I just scroll down and I'll, I'll come back up, um, for example here, DCO1, this is my primary domain controller. I can change the type from DHCP, which is the default to DHCP reservation, and say when this boots, I want it to have 102, 140.0, and then I can choose the IP and save that. So that there is going to be the IP that I want to specify up the top here under the, um, the DNS configuration. So that's going to allow me to go in um, and configure the, you know, the DNS servers for all of these servers that subsequently boot up. So that's where I'd specify any Active Directory DNS servers for my network. If I don't, obviously it's going to use our, our default uh, DNS server. I can't remember if it's Google or, or the PFSense firewall, but it'll just be a generic uh, external DNS server. Uh, the next thing is um, requesting a public IP. So if you want to start setting up VPNs, they will require a public IP. As I mentioned, it does have a cost. You can add one now. Uh, and really anything else you want to configure that I'm about to show you is reliant on having the public IP there first. So you can add an IP. It'll instantly generate one. You can release them at any time. Um, you can then set that as the firewall's WAN IP, particularly if you're requesting multiple public IPs, we can only have one for the firewall. Um, and that's required if you want to set up site-to-site -site VPN. Uh, and we've got good documentation in our user guide on various different firewalls using IPsec VPN, uh, and also open VPN. If you've got users that want to go home, you can create a VPN for a user, and then they can just VPN straight into this network. So that, again, both of them do require the public IP to be pre-configured. Um, I've talked a little bit about how you can change the DHCP reservation here, but then finally you've got the ability to do port porting, or, or as we call it here, network uh, port mapping. So what you'll need to do is choose the public IP, you'll then need to choose a port number, for example, Exchange, SMTP, and you'll need to choose a private IP. So it's only going to show me ones that you've reserved, it won't show the default DHCP one, so I've got that DNS server there, for example, is reserved, I can select that, uh, I can choose the port number, and then the protocol, so SMTP. 25 for SMTP, and I can add that rule in. So very easy to do. Again, because this firewall is running, I've just made a change. If I'm trying to test that and it's not working, I probably need to come in and click restart network to reboot that network uh, and reload any of the changes I've made. So very, very easy to use this front end portal. It caters for most scenarios, but again, if you need something more complex, you can manually configure the network. Uh, and finally, we've got this cool patented virtual machine policy. So I really like this feature, uh, particularly if you've got multiple servers for a customer. And the idea is you pre-configure the firewall, you come in here and you'll drag the machines from the left side into the policy. And what you can do, and, and oh, I've done this a while ago, so some of these don't exist, 
but effectively I've got DCO2 will immediately boot with zero delay and then I've got RDO1 that's going to wait a couple of minutes after that has started and then that will boot. And what that means is my remote desktop server is going to boot up and log into the domain uh, and obviously before the domain controller boots the network would start. So I can configure this order, I can obviously drag more and more machines in uh, and create a policy in terms of what's the encryption key, pre-save it, what's the uh, you know the boot delay, uh, and then you know basically say what it's what it's waiting to boot from and we configure that order. So policy is really cool. Uh, one click and you're done. You don't need to go in and boot up each individual machine as as per the one that I did earlier. This will go through and boot based on the order and the policy with a single click. So that's really nice. Uh, and obviously, again, more applicable for larger sites where you want to automate the whole process. So just jumping back, I can see this machine still booting. What's interesting here is that depending on your operating system, so I've found that uh, 2012, Windows Server 2012 or Windows 10 upwards, seems to take a little bit longer to boot because it'll actually do its own device discovery. Uh, you know, if I'd done a demo of, say, a 2008 server, um, it, it tends to boot up a lot quicker because it doesn't do its own device discovery. So, you know, the expectation is it's going to take, you know, a couple of minutes to go through the boot process and obviously detect all the drivers of, of the new hypervisor and so forth. Uh, but it'll boot up and then it will pick up its IP from the firewall and, and you'll be up and running. So, you know, this is obviously the console connection for the administrator. The users aren't going to come in through here. They're going to go in through RDP or VPN or port forwarding to access their application. But yeah, really, um, you know, I think I've demonstrated most of this product from here. As you can see, again, very easy to use. Um, and, you know, you've got this immediate self-service portal to go and, and do testing and, and configuring as you need. Um, but, you know, key recommendations are around getting that networking set up and testing it and making sure you've got the appropriate CPU and memory uh, configured and ready to go. All right, well, I think I'll leave it at there for now. Um, if anyone's got any questions, I'll, I'll take a moment to review that. Probably one thing actually um, I would like to do is I've created a little poll. Uh, I'm just gonna try and bring that up now. I'd really like to know from everyone what particular products they're interested in. Obviously, I haven't covered off the products in detail today, but it would just be handy to know, uh, for my reference, you know, are you looking at this for Shadow Protect or Shadow Safe or One Safe Solo, uh, or if you're not sure, but you can select multiple options here. It's just a quick way for me to get a bit of visibility into what, what people are looking at using this for. Uh, obviously, the majority of our partners uh, you know, as this large amount of our partners are still using Shadow Protect um, as, as our, uh, you know, long-standing product. Um, but yeah, we, we're starting to see some transition, particularly for uh, net new or larger customers um, coming into some of the newer uh, Shadow Safe and, and the Solo obviously has only just very recently been released. Um, so look, appreciate um, your, your time with that poll. Um, I'll just close that off now. Um, so I'll just give another couple of seconds for anyone else to, to punch that in. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll start going through any Q&A. So look, if there's anything I skimmed over and you'd like to see more of, you've got any questions, feel free to, to use the questions and answers now. Uh, again, if, if you um, don't have any questions, I will be emailing out a recording of this afterwards. Um, I've also got a product uh, data sheet in the handouts. You're welcome to go and download from here or, or grab off our website. So I'll, I'll actually, I'll just leave that poll up for a minute and we'll, we'll take a look at the Q&A um, to see if there's any questions come through. Okay, we'll just come over here. So I'm just gonna try and make this a little bigger to read. Just bear with me. All right, cool. There's a, there's a good couple of questions coming through. All right, I'm just gonna close off that poll. Um, so um, when does Shadow Protect upgrade C drives from two terabytes? I have a six terabyte of data and ordering three times drives is very inconvenient. Yes, yeah, so look, it is, it is kind of annoying uh, having three two terabyte drives, particularly the problem is actually more if you've got one server that's larger. Um, so look, um, I know it is possible uh, and I just can't remember the process, um, but we can enable you as a reseller to have options to see more of them. Generally, uh, what I've actually done is I go in and request a two terabyte one, and then I email support, 
uh, sorry, I don't email them, I log a support case and go, hey support, I've just requested a C drive for this account, can you please make sure a six terabyte one is sent to me and then I'll just do that. I've found that seems to work, I can't actually remember what the official process is, if you're concerned about doing that, just log the support ticket first and, and I'll hold your hand through that. So um, yeah, look, there's no cost for that. Um, the drive is a bigger form factor drive, so they can't send multiple large ones. It'll be a single one with, a, with its own power supply. But um, yeah, I agree. Uh, look, if, if you've got a large number, it is easier just to have one big drive. Um, someone's asked, if the site has physical servers in a SAN, then how do we approach the configuration of the C and data in SAN for virtualization? So um, I'm not too sure on, on that question. It might need some further uh, collaboration. But yeah, basically um, the Shadow Protect uh, software or the Shadow Safe, well, with Shadow Protect, you'll select the volumes you want to be in the backup. With Shadow Safe, it will select all volumes and then you can go through and uh, you know, tell it not to include certain volumes. They will get uh, sent into our cloud and in our cloud will automatically boot that with the original drive letters um, you know, in the same layout. So, so that's really uh, handled automatically. I, I don't know how I can answer that further or what the, the actual question of it is. Um, how will the, the synchronization work uh, virtualized by end users um, in the BMR received? So yeah, I think I covered that off to some degree when I talked about the BMR. So when you're running in our cloud, we continually take hourly snapshots. So you're not waiting for us to ship you the BMR drive. You know, and you, you again may not even request a BMR drive for two weeks until the hardware turns up. You request the BMR drive. Uh, and we ship it back to you once you've got it. You, there's a wizard driven process to pre stage that data back on into the environment, uh, and then it will automatically start syncing with our cloud, pre staging it ready for a very quick cutover. Um, Okay, what, what is support email address to request a bigger drive? So uh, Jason, sorry, when I did say email, I actually uh, incorrectly, you need to go to support.storagecraft.com and scroll down to the bottom and click contact support. So you need to log a case through the web browser and just make sure they capture all the details that they're going to need there. So you, you don't email them, you'll need to, to log a ticket first. That will then send you an email uh, with the case number and then you can proceed by email from uh, that way going first. Um, Another question here, if I'm a partner um, off a premium, um, oh, look, look, someone's asking a couple of uh, complex questions here. I'm, I'm getting a little bit overwhelmed with the detail. If, look, if, if you've got particular questions, my email's here, happy to sit down with you and cover off any of your specifics. Um, you know, obviously we've got a, a full uh, sales team um, around that, that and, and all of the territories that, that can help you through this as well. But um, I'm going to leave it at there for today. Uh, I don't think any more questions have come through for now. So thank you for coming. Again, it has been recorded. I'll make sure this gets emailed out to uh, everyone that attended. Uh, and really appreciate your time today. Thank you.